Good morning everyone and I hope um, you're connecting to some of the worship we've tried to prepare for you today. Um, I want to share with you the two readings that are for today. Uh, the first reading comes to us from Ezekiel chapter 37 and verses 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Come, breath from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you, and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. And then the New Testament reading comes to us today from John chapter 11, verses 1 to 45. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus was now lay sick, was the same Mary who had poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, A short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he had meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go up to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, so that we may die with him. On his arrival Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, 
My brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know I will, he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews had been with Mary in their the house comforting her, no, when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved them. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Jesus, come and be our teacher. Come and inspire us by your word to be a people of faith. Come and deepen within us a trust and a confidence in you that we can hope in your promises. For we pray this in your name. Amen. What peculiar times. What an unusual situation to be in. To be in a lockdown in one's own home with the threat of a virus that seems to be traversing the globe and infecting people in their hundreds of thousands. To face such a reality is something that I think none of us could have expected or foreseen. And the reality is it's not just this virus that is a cause of concern, it's the repercussions of this virus. The reality that for many, many people this virus does not just mean sickness or illness, but it also means poverty and incredible economic hardship. It means distancing from family and friends. It means being alone. Maybe even for some of us it means being together with those we struggle to be with. And it seems so overwhelming that this time so many things coming against us. As a nation, we face so many challenges. Just this past Friday, hearing that our country had been downgraded economically, and economists tell us that that will have significant impacts on our government and its ability to deliver services, especially to those most in need. It almost seems like we're in a perfect storm. Somehow, miraculously, we survive the 300 years of colonialism. Somehow, miraculously, we survive the, the, the years of apartheid. Somehow, miraculously, we've survived a period where our government seemed to be caught up in corruption and selfish self-interest. And now, just as we're beginning to try and rebuild, fighting the forces of evil and trying to make sense of what's going on, comes this storm. And it just seems too much to bear. And so, it's quite amazing to discover these two readings. 
for these two readings, both of them deal with moments in people's lives that are seemingly overwhelming, overwhelming with despair and grief and brokenness. In Ezekiel, we find the nation of Israel, a corporate group of people who are in, in exile. Their nation has been torn apart. They've been scattered across the area. They are no longer together. They are disjointed and broken. They're feeling hopeless. They have no imagination for how things can be mended and restored and made whole. It seems too much. There seems no hope. And then we turn to the New Testament reading. And here it goes from a corporate experience of grief and sorrow and brokenness to a family one. A story of a single person dying. Many of us listening to this know the pain of grief, the sense of loss, the anger, the disbelief, the, the surprise, it, it not seeming real what's going on, trying to make sense of it. And we read then of this family seemingly torn apart. And it's again not just the grief of the loss of this person Lazarus, but we learn that Mary and Martha seem to be alone. They rely on their brother as the male in the household in a, in a culture which needed and required that person to safeguard them. And now they've lost their protector. They're not only vulnerable to grief, they're vulnerable to economic deprivation. Why these readings? Why would those who compiled the lectionary place these readings into Lent and invite us to reflect and read on them? Why do we journey through Lent each year? Well, I'd want to suggest to you today that Lent is a time of preparation, an invitation to consider our commitment to Jesus, our trust and our confidence in God. And so these two texts, I think, offer us a profound challenge. Are we willing to allow hope to speak to grief? Are we living, allowed, willing to allow hope to speak to despair? Are we willing to commit again and place our trust and our confidence in God? who brings life where it seems no possibility of life exists. Ezekiel faced that. To be a prophet in the midst of a place where people were grieving and anxious. He'd been a prophet of doom for so many years that almost it seems that despair and depression must have overwhelmed him. And now God leads him into a valley of dry bones where it seems that the bones stretch into the horizon, jumble together in a mishmash, where it seems that nothing can be repaired and made whole of them. And there's a deep, deep brokenness, because for the Jewish folk at that time, they believed that the bones had to be gathered together, put together in a safe place, so that one day in the resurrection, flesh could be restored to them, and they could be made whole again. But here we just see the bones jumbled together. What hope could there be? And so God says to him, do you think these dry bones can live again? And I don't know what he was feeling, but I have a sense that there was something of his brokenness then. Because he cannot bring himself to say yes. He cannot bring himself to hope and trust in God at this point. His despair seems to settle onto him like a mantle that weighs him down. He's bound under his grief, his hopelessness, his sense of anxiety or fear, his aloneness. And it seems that these feelings rule his life. And so all he can say is, God, you know. But God does not give up on him, even in the midst of his hopelessness. God does not cast him inside, well, you don't believe enough. But rather God invites him to participate in this moment. And so God says, no, no, I see your despair. I notice your brokenness. I, I, I sense your hopelessness. But I want you to participate in this action of healing and restoration. You prophesy. And so he begins to prophesy. Breath. Breath, come and restore and make whole. And he hears a strange and startling sound. It's like something out of a, a horror movie. Their bones begin to join together, sinew to sinew. And gradually they begin to become whole. And flesh begins to be knitted around them until eventually it seems they are whole. But there's still no life. In the Hebrew, we notice that ten times the word bones is mentioned. And ten times the word ruach, the spirit of God, the breath of God is mentioned. Until eventually these bones are knit together, but the breath has not entered them. Just as the breath needed to enter into that human creature created in the Genesis account. And so again, 
the invitation. Partner me. Let's work together. And so Ezekiel and God together facilitate and enable a healing and restoration. And breath enters into these bodies and they become alive and well again. It's almost like God had to take Ezekiel to the place of his deepest despair, the valley of dry bones, and confront that reality and say, I see it, I notice it, I'm not indifferent to what you're experiencing, I know what you're going through. But I am busy and at work. It almost like he needed to give, give, give him an experience, an image of this. The incredible power of experience and image. He couldn't just hear about it. He had to live through it a bit. And only once he's lived through it can he then be instructed. Now go tell Israel that even though they feel there's no hope, no possibility, there is hope. I'm at work seeking to restore and make whole and return them to the place from which they feel so far away. I am bringing together all the paths of their families that have been torn apart through slavery and brokenness and scattered across the area until they don't know each other anymore. They don't know where each other are. They seem alone. I am knitting it all together. I am bringing community where there seemed only death. And in the same way, the New Testament passage offers us the same invitation to go on a journey where in the midst of the grief of hopelessness, seeming that nothing can be done, He's buried. He's not only just buried. He's been buried for a number of days. The smell is there. The people of Jesus' day believed that for three days after the death of someone, the spirit hovered around the area. But on the fourth day, the spirit was gone. And all that was left was the physical body. And so it's the fourth day. There's nothing left. Death has come finally and fully. But again, Jesus comes. And he comes in order to bring glory and enable people to trust God. Mary has that sense of trust and Martha too, because they recognize in Jesus a friend and a comforter. Martha recognizes the possibility of the resurrection, but can't believe it's possible now in my situation. She can only believe it's possible at some future date, at another place maybe that I might experience at some point. It can't be true for now, for here. And again, what I find so beautiful is that Jesus walks into that experience, doesn't ignore it, in fact feels it, in fact feels it so deeply that he's, he's in a place of weeping. And his stomach almost is wrapped up with the grief, if you look at the Greek. And then he walks to that tomb, invites them to roll away a stone, and he calls forth. The one who had seemed was gone. And Lazarus emerges from the tomb. I wonder if any of them had even imagined that, dreamt that possibility. I wonder what it was like for Lazarus himself to find himself alive again. We don't read too much of his account. You see, friends, in the midst of the deepest and darkest place, I think there is always an invitation to hope. What is hope? Hope is an inner joy that comes from knowing that there is one at work who has power to make things whole. An inner joy. A sense of well-being, of excitement, of anticipation, of expectation that there is one who can make things well who is at work. I don't know today how small or big your hope is. I don't know how small or big your despair is. But I wonder today what these two texts would want to say to your despair. If these two texts were to speak to your despair, what would they say? And how would your despair respond? I wonder if you were to listen to these texts, if your despair would get smaller or bigger. I wonder what it would be like to not only listen to these texts, but listen to the one who ultimately is the author of them. I wonder what it would be like to begin to trust and believe that there is one who can restore and make whole, who is present and available to you, who is with you right now, in the very room you sit. And I wonder if you would allow God to speak to your despair, what would God say? 
I wonder what words God would address to despair. And I wonder how despair would respond. I have a suspicion that when we allow God to speak in this way, God brings some friends. Brings friends like hope. Brings friends like joy. Bring friends like peace. Brings friends like faith. Brings friends like love. I would want to invite you today to welcome God, to welcome God's friends, and allow them to influence and shape and form and fashion your faith, your hope, your joy, your love, your peace. So that you might find in the midst of the anxiety that we're living through at the moment, the courage to face each day and to be the person you need to be in this situation, a person of faith and hope. May God bless us as each of us seek to live in the way that God dreams for us. Amen.